as I was saying, we met the ladies in the jail and all of our studies are designed for longitudinal follow-up, which means that we do an intervention around a women's health issue. In this case, it was cervical cancer and sexual health prevention. My name is Mega Ramaswamy. I'm a professor of population health at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. The study was designed to follow them for three years to see if what we had done with them, the education we had given them, the sort of chatting about, you know, the issues and how to receive care, access care, et cetera, would actually translate into women being able to like increase their rates of cervical cancer screening, for example, or, you know, be more adept at navigating STD screening. So we asked the women for all kinds of contact information, including where do you live? What's your phone number? Of course, the women's addresses and phone numbers change all the time. So we also ask things like, where do you usually go for drug treatment? Where do you go to church? What's your Facebook handle? And also like, is there a street corner where you hang out? So Sarah had said, she'll be on Prospect and 35th. This is 35 and Prospect. And a year later, we go out to look for Sarah and we're like, oh, it's a nice day like this. We were like, Let's just roll up to 35th and Prospect. And lo and behold, we rolled up and guess who we saw outside? Sarah. It was incredible. She was exactly where she said she would be. We have this policy of, you know, if the women don't want to be associated with us because we look like cops or crazy or whatever, that we would let them sort of say how they know us. So Joy kind of walked up to her and was like, hey, you know, Miss Sarah, remember me? And then she was like, oh my God, Joy. And she immediately started crying. And then she took us into that shop and introduced us. Wow. When we first started doing our community work, this is the exact place our participant brought us. And we went around, we got candy and junk food, and we met some people. And it was just so amazing because this was such a staple. Normally this is just full of stuff that our community uses. And it's such a, such a landmark for us. We went in, we got some candy. I think, Mega, we almost parked in this exact spot. But yeah. We bought some candy. She introduced bought us to Rags and Brothers store owners. And she said, if you ever need to find me, these guys will know where I am. It's been eight years. And so over the eight years, we have gone to these people and been like, have you seen Miss Sarah? They've always known. They know oh, where she's she is. not out today. Uh, yeah, she left to go do whatever. She'll be back in an hour. They always knew where she was. Broadly speaking, the SHE team is focused on women's health in the context of mass incarceration. All of our funding comes from the National Cancer Institute, which is funded by the National Institutes of Health. We do programming around cervical cancer screening, breast cancer screening, sexually transmitted infection prevention, and reproductive goal planning. Yes, it is true we work with people who are active drug users who sometimes sell sex to support a drug habit or just to get cash for income. And we are not operating from a place of, please stop doing those things. We are operating from a place of, if you're gonna do those things, tell us how you stay safe and how can we help facilitate that safety for you? That is the definition of harm reduction, to not eliminate the behavior, but to do, reduce the risks associated with that behavior. I think the rapport between us and the participants is really driven by this idea of love and respect, that we show generosity of spirit and that we listen and pay attention. If you infuse the ethic of love into your work, that the work is not only more meaningful, but it's more impactful. Especially important when you're working in a context of mass incarceration that's so difficult. When I was in graduate school for sociology, the president of our university made the statement that you are not here to be a consumer of knowledge, you're here to be a producer of knowledge. And that was really impactful for me. And so the opportunity to teach students filmmaking is an opportunity to teach them how to produce new content. 
In this Master of Public Health class, we have, I think, about 15 students who are working on this film project, and they are learning how to write for documentary film, how to shoot documentary film, and a large portion of their semester will be focused on how to edit for documentary film. The jargon in medical literature is you know, it's garbage to a lot of people. And so using film as a medium to deliver a message helps you get away from all of those barriers that education and academia has traditionally presented for the public. I mean, this is very much what we call in sociology, sociology for the public. Traditionally, as academic, we spend months and months and months writing research papers. And then those papers get out after much difficulty, and six people read them. What kind of impact do you have if only six people consume your papers that you've spent months working on? And the documentary as a medium allows us to be able to reach a much broader audience. Something I worry about in sort of writing about women's stories is, who am I? As a person who sits in the ivory tower with all of my power and all of my privilege related to my education and my social position to tell other women's stories. And so the beauty of putting women on film is that they can share their own stories. My name is Purple. I am from Kansas City, Kansas. My name is Goldie and I'm from Boot Hill, Missouri. My name is Red and I'm originally from Kansas City, Kansas. If we're operating from the principle that the medium is the message, the thing we always say on our team is it's about changing hearts and minds. That mass incarceration policy may change, right? But for the most part, it takes a really long time to reverse criminal legal system policies that disproportionately target poor people and people of color. We talk about critical health literacy as part of our intervention strategy, getting women to think critically about the way they operate in a, in a given health system or context. And I think the same is true of media literacy, that we have so much access to media, yet we seem to be consuming it in ways that are less and less critical.